On today's episode of Let's Talk F1, we look back at how the 2018 season has unfolded so far, we look forward at the 2018 Belgian Grand Preview, and we discuss the future content for this channel and a few little announcements that I think you'll all very much look forward to. All that and more, next. Welcome back to Let's Talk F1, everyone. Welcome to the second ever Let's Talk F1 in a week where F1 itself is returning. This weekend sees the end of the summer break. It's been a very long three weeks, but this week, finally, the Belgian Grand Prix is returning as well as a brand new edition for the F1 games. F1 2018 hits shelves this Friday. Talking about that a little bit later on, but... With the summer break coming to an end, with the midpoint of the season almost being gone now, I think it's about time I look back at the season. Many people have done this, and I planned on doing this at the beginning of the summer, but never really got around to it, being very busy with all driver announcements, silly season. So I think before we get to the Belgian Grand Prix, it's best we look back at how the season has unfolded so far, and my sort of mid-season review, who I think has performed the best, maybe not has got the most points, who I think has been driver of the season so far, and almost my predictions for the end of the season. So that's what we've got to look forward to right now. Let's jump straight into it. Let's get straight into the details, starting with the mid-season review. Now, the way I'm going to do this is, like I do in race review sometimes, I'm going to go through the order of each driver in the constructors. Well, we'll do the drivers actually today. We'll do the drivers championship. We'll go through each driver starting from last place in 20th position, going all the way up each position, evaluating each driver, maybe what their best performance of the season was so far, heading all the way to P1 and then discussing the title fight and everything that goes on with that. So hopefully that all makes sense. Let's start then at the tail end of the grid. I imagine the bottom drivers, there won't be too much to talk about. But let's just jump in with P20, the only man with no points scored so far this season, Sergei Sorokin. Now, I think there's plenty to say about Sorokin, the Russian rookie in F1 this season. For me, he's impressed in a very, very bad car. Yes, he hasn't scored points, and that's got to be an issue, and that'll be something highlighted within the team. But if I'm being honest, I think Sorokin, with a best finish of 13th in Austria, has been level with Stroll, if not some weekends, like Monaco, Germany sticking out in my mind, of being races where Sergei Sorokin was better than Lance Stroll. And Lance Stroll, who I believe is on four points at the moment, with that one point finish in Azerbaijan, I think they've been very closely matched. And both of those drivers, I think it's very quick. Like I say, I mean, what can you say in, about that Williams team? The car isn't good enough. They're not going to be scoring points. However, Sorokin has really impressed in the way he carries himself, handles interviews, the way he speaks about the team. It's very impressive. And compared to his teammate Stroll, which I think is the only real comparison you can make in that Williams team, I would rather keep Sergei Sorokin, if I was being 100% honest. I think he's much better for brand image. I mean, Lance Stroll, I don't think he's the worst driver. I think out of the two, Lance Stroll's the quicker driver, but the baggage he comes with, the negative publicity, having that title of a paid driver doesn't help the team. And yes, like I say, Stroll brings his money. So does Sorokin. But I think going forward, Sorokin would be the better driver to keep, looking at it from Williams's terms. And with Force India being bought out by Lawrence Stroll. It looks like Lance Stroll's moving on anyway. So Sorokin, not really too much to say, and I'm going to score each driver at 10, and it's been very difficult for him, but I'm going to give him a 6 out of 10. You know, I, I can't go too crazy. A 7, I think, would be, for me, that's a good season. But I feel it's hard to give him a 7 because we haven't really seen too much of him, and we can only compare him to Lance Stroll, which even him, he's a bit of an unknown considering how dodgy and inconsistent he was last season compared to Felipe Massa. So it's very difficult to tell with Sergei Sorokin, but I'm going to give him a 6 out of 10. Swiftly moving on then, 
to the next team. And I'll mention now, before the comments go crazy, these pitches in the background, it's going to be difficult for me to single out each driver. So some of those pitches with Sorokin were actually Lance Stroll. So I'm going to just do it the team car. Just so you know, going forward, that's what I'm going to be doing in this episode. I know it's annoying. And I know continuity really, that doesn't line up, does it? But just for the sake of this one, we're just going to show pictures of the team rather than the driver. Though sometimes I might slash in a couple of pictures of the drivers. Anyway, 19. Brendan Hartley. The Kiwi, who at the beginning of the season, a lot of people wanted him out. A lot of people around the Canadian Grand Prix. He hadn't had the best start of the season. He scored a point in Azerbaijan, but apart from that, several DNFs. And in that Canadian Grand Prix where he crashed out with Lance Stroll, many thought he wouldn't be there at Paul Ricard. But he was. He stuck with it. A few more DNFs, to be fair to him. But since then, he seems to have upped his skills a little bit more, seems to have dealed with the pressure, if that makes sense, and he seems to have sat in his seat with a different elegance, a different style, and now seems to be getting slowly better and better results in that car. You just look at the last two races, 10th in Germany, 11th in Hungary. Now, yes, different things went on in those Grand Prix, but still, you've got to be in the right place at the right time to pick up those points, and Hartley... You could argue, even at the Hungarian Grand Prix, his teammate Pierre Gasly demolished him, the same as Bahrain. And I don't want to go crazy with Brendan Hartley. I'm giving him praise here, but he's not been great, you know? And I'm going to quickly get out of the way now. Out of 10, I'm going to give him a 4. And he's such a nice guy. And some people probably think that's a bit harsh, but you've got to look at the comparison with his teammate there. They are definitely, Torosso this is, they are definitely in this midfield fight where... If I'm being honest, I think anyone from Renault and Haas, arguably the fourth best team, or yeah, fourth best team, all the way down to Sauber, the second worst best team, again, arguably compared to each weekend, any of those teams in that midfield could be picking up best of the rest each weekend. And Pierre Gasly has been there on two or three occasions, has been that best of the rest, whereas Brendan Hartley has never been that. And for me, that's a huge, huge outlier where Torosso, to be honest, in this fight, want to be picking up as many points as they can. So Hartley, for me, unfortunately, for the Kiwis, he's only going to get a 4 out of 10. But he's really dealt with the pressure really well, and so that has upped his score a little bit for me, but still haven't been blown away by Brendan Hartley this season. All right, swiftly moving on then. We need to get through these back markers as quick as we can. Lance Stroll, PAT. We spoke about Williams already a little bit, and like I say, it's very hard to compare these guys. Now, Lance Stroll... I think I might, yeah, I'm going to give him a higher grade than Sergei Sorokin, despite me earlier saying that Sorokin has been the better of the two. The reason I say this is that Lance Stroll is under so much pressure, and Sorokin's a rookie, he's come in and impressed. Stroll had a, like I said, inconsistent first year in Formula One. And I, I've just had a few minutes just to take it in about what I said about Sorokin. Thinking about Stroll's performances this year, he has outperformed that Williams car on several occasions. The points finish in Azerbaijan being a prime example of that. This is a car that shouldn't be in the points and he's been right on the fringe on several occasions. And Lance Stroll for me has stepped it up a gear this year, especially compared to last year, in a very different car and a very difficult car this year I think back to Q2 he got into in the first race of the season we all thought well is that good is that bad well if a Williams got into Q2 now I think we'd all be very impressed he's got a couple of 11th places a couple of 12th places only two, three DNF so far and for me Lance Stroll hasn't been all that bad he's not been stellar I wouldn't go that crazy and I'm gonna give him I'm gonna give him a six out of ten the same as Sorokin because like I said earlier I think they're very nip and tuck these two and some weekends, one of them might blow the other out of the water. But on the whole, I think they're very well balanced. And it's almost like table tennis in my head, ping pong, back and forth. There's pros and cons for each of them. But if I'm being honest, I think they're both the same. Six for the season so far. And even for that one points finish for Stroll, very impressive. And you could say he has outperformed his teammate on a whole like that, on just looking at the numbers. But I think... When you look at it deeper, I think they are very evenly matched. And if Sorokin had had a better strategy, got a bit luckier at the start in that race where he had contact with Alonso, that could have been a very different picture. 
So that's where I'm going to leave that one. Moving into 17th, we got a new team again. We've got Sauber now, and that's Marcus Eriksson. The man who hadn't scored a point in F1 since 2015 has already picked up five this season. And the Swede, who is up against a very, very difficult teammate in Charles Leclerc, if I'm being honest, this is probably the best car he's ever had in Formula 1. That Samba was okay in 2015, but I still think this is the best car he has ever had. Scoring points in Bahrain, Austria and Germany this season three times for Marcus Ericsson. It's a career best. And you know what? I really wanted him to do well this year. And he's not done poorly. Five points is okay, but in a car that I think could be capable of more... I, it's difficult. It is difficult because, like I said, that Sauber is probably the second worst car on the grid. And it's very difficult to see if it's a good car or Charles Leclerc is outperforming the car. And when you look at the difference, an eight-point difference between Ericsson and Leclerc doesn't really seem like that much. However... Leclerc seems to be consistently getting in the points this season. I think, I'll check in a minute when we get on to Charles Leclerc, I feel like he's been in the points more this season than out of the points. That might be a bit of an exaggeration, but he's definitely been in Q2 more than he has Q1. As in, gone out in Q2 than he has Q1. He's been very impressive in qualifying, Charles Leclerc, and generally has turned that into race pace and points. Something that Ericsson has lacked... And I'd like to see more of in this second half of the season. Marcus, I'm going to give a 5 out of 10. But I think being outperformed by rookie Charles Leclerc hasn't helped him whatsoever. But I think he has made a step up this year. But I'm not sure if it'll be enough to keep his seat. Right, let's move on to P16. The man with 8 points. And probably one of the biggest talking points of this video, I think. And that's Stoffel Van Dorn in the McLaren. Now, the gap between Van Dorn and Alonso is pretty monstrous. It's pretty monstrous. 36 points separates the two of them. And yes, you could look at Bottas and Hamilton and say the gap's bigger there. But I know this is going to sound weird, but if you convert that, use an exchange rate of the top three teams, Formula A, if you will, and Formula B, the worth of points, that gap is huge. And for that midfield fight again, like Ericsson and Leclerc, that group, every point counts. And Van Dorn, who went on an incredible run at the beginning of the season. His best run in Formula 1. Three-point scores in a row. Was very, very impressive. But then after that, nothing. Hungry last time out. Looked very promising for points until the car broke down. But Stoffel has had a really, really difficult season. And it's hard to place him again. A, a bit like Marcus Ericsson. He's up against such hard, or well, such a hard and high caliber teammate. Are they having a bad season? And, and for Van Dorn, it's really hard to tell. And I think as well with these new generation cars, a bad Saturday can automatically mean a bad Sunday. And what I mean by that is, if on the first lap, you don't have the pace to straight away get in front of people. Fernando Alonso is a prime example here, Van Dorn's teammate. Alonso has a knack for getting in front of people on that opening lap, working his way through the traffic, through the carnage, and just getting positions. Van Dorn doesn't really have that, and generally seems to go backwards off the start. But we know these new cars are so difficult to overtake. Sometimes that opening lap, and the difference in quality between Alonso and Van Dorn on the opening lap, can cause a huge rift in points come the end of the race. Now, I'm very aware there's a difference in complete talent between Alonso and Van Dorn. They're complete different levels of the spectrum. Alonso being a two-time world champion with multiple years of experience, Van Dorn is only in his second full season. And so comparing the two is very, very difficult. Van Dorn, I will say, hasn't been as good as Alonso this year. Will he keep his seat for next year? I think so. I think he deserves another chance. But if he doesn't perform for the rest of the season, if he doesn't pick up any more points, then question marks, I think, should be asked. And at tracks like Hungary, where power and engine isn't as much of an issue, McLaren seemed to do well. Not so much in qualifying, but in the race and strategy, it seemed to be all going to plan. So in Singapore, in a few races' time, that'll be a clear indicator, not only how quick this, well, this McLaren car is, 
But if Van Dorn is able to beat Alonso in a couple of races this season and the remaining races, out qualifying him, well, once would be helpful if he out qualified him once. That would really help him going forward. But it's really difficult to Van, well, put Van Dorn at a high number out of 10 this season and give him a high score. So unfortunately for Stoffel, it's only going to be a three. And that pains me to do that because I think he has the talent. And like I say, I think he deserves another shot. But this season hasn't been good enough so far. And in the second half, he's a driver I'm looking at to do much, much better. Right. P15. Charles Leclerc. The rookie, the highest placed rookie in this whole entire season so far. And he's my highest scoring rookie as well. The Monegas driver has impressed almost everyone in Formula 1 this season. Up and down the grid, from rival teams, from his own team. Everyone involved, everyone watching the sport loves this guy. And wants him to do well and almost wants him to get that Ferrari seat. The Raikkonen fans, including myself a little bit, I've still got a little soft spot for Raikkonen. We want, to, we want him to stay a little bit, we really do, but is it Charles Leclerc's time? We will have to wait and see. He deserves a chance for sure, and he will get that Ferrari drive at some point. Question marks is when. The man is an absolute machine, scoring points multiple times. I've already gone through him quite a bit when I was talking about Marcus Ericsson. But it seems to be scoring points more regularly than he doesn't. Scoring points in his fourth race with a sixth place. In Azerbaijan, in the second worst car. That is ridiculous. And after that sixth place, he's got one, two, three, four, four more point scores. More recently in Britain, Germany, and Hungary, he's got under the radar with two DNFs in Great Britain. I can't quite remember why he DNF'd, and I'm trying to rack my brain, but it's not quite not quite remembering, so I do apologise there. Germany was a bit of a an outlier, really. Changing conditions, they put him onto the Inters. He had a spin while he was on the slicks and wasn't the most comfortable weekend for Charles and Hungary last time out DNF'd on the opening lap as well. But apart from those last three races, for me, he's been stellar. Probably if he hadn't have had those last three races, he'd have been my highest rated driver, but he's not going to quite be there. But he has been a monster this season, absolute force, a future world champion. I think I'm going to say I'm happy. I'm hard happily say that this guy is fantastic. Charles Leclerc, oh, do I do it? We're going to go 8 out of 10. Almost went 9. It's it's 8 or 9, but we're going to go 8 out of 10. Because there's still some times where I'd like to see him do a bit more, but you can't deny when he's fighting up against Fernando Alonso, the Renault boys, the Haas boys, he looks like he's in a monster of a car when he's really not. He looks so comfortable, especially against Fernando, the two times world champion. He's looked very, very comfortable fighting, and again, like I say, in a car that's not as good as that McLaren. So really solid job from Charles Leclerc thus far. Right, let's move on to P14. And pains me to say it, probably the biggest underachiever so far this season, and that is a huge statement, but I've, I've got to say it, is Roman Grosjean. Another driver I have a huge soft spot for, and I'll just quickly mention, if you aren't aware, I was a big Lotus fan back in the day. And so Grosjean and Raikkonen, I do have a soft spot for, especially Grosjean. But, this season's been poor. This season has been horrendous for Roman. The first time he scored points this season was in Austria. Fourth place, very, very impressive. His best result for Haas, Haas's best ever result in Formula 1. You've got to respect that. But before that, he didn't score a single point. DNF in four times this season already. Almost looked like the 2012 Grosjean where every single time he was in a fight he was crashing, DNF in. And it did look like, if I'm being honest, it did look like he might go all season without getting any points. It was really getting that bad. And question marks from the team that have given him full support, they were starting to arise. People were saying, is he good enough for Haas? Are we going to have to replace him? I can tell you now they're not going to for next year. I can 100% say that. And you might think that's because... I'm a Grosjean fanboy. Well, it's not. It's because they have come out and said, Grosjean took the gamble. He was loyal with us through the tough times. We'll be loyal with him. And I thought this might be a bit of a controversial statement, but I'd love to know your thoughts. Is Grosjean's season this year worse than Magnussen's last year? I, I think Magnussen's was worse, mainly because of all the deliberate, dangerous acts he made. Grosjean this year 
Spain was awful. That was a horrendous, stupid mistake from Grosjean. Great Britain as well, a little bit dodgy. But other incidents like Azerbaijan, he just lost it himself. Whereas Magnussen last year was really, really overly aggressive every time he was getting in a fight. And so I think because Haas put their loyalty in Magnussen for a second season, they will with Grosjean. So Grosjean will be staying next season. But for me, the biggest, biggest underachiever this season in a car that should be best of the rest. He should be fighting for that seventh place in the championship. And there's still a long, long way to go. And he's not that far behind a few maybe three weekends getting fourth and fifth places if he can making the best of big retirements at the front then things can change around but I, I don't really see that happening and I think his aim now for the rest of the season will be a top 10 finish and helping Haas to fourth in the constructors if they can do it but being in arguably the fourth best car this year Grosjean has not performed and he's gonna have to get a oh no, we're going to have to give him a 2 out of 10. That's horrendous. That pains me. Oh, that, that stings. That really stings. But we've got to be honest. We've got to be brutal here. He's turned it around recently, for sure. And in Germany, I will just quickly mention, that was a stellar drive. Probably his best of the season, I would say. But he needs to continue that form now for the rest of the season. His early form, not good enough. Grows on 2 out of 10. Really hurts me to say. <laughs> really does. Anyway, P13. The new Red Bull man for next season, Pierre Gasly. 26 points in a Toro Rosso Honda. A car, like I say, very similar to the Sauber. Almost the second worst on the grid, but on its day, can perform at a very high level, as shown by Gasly many times this season, including that big result in the second race of the season in Bahrain, a P4, Monaco, a P7, and Hungary, a P6. In a car, like I say... That shouldn't really be anywhere near those positions. Gasly has earned this Red Bull drive. There's not a lot to say about Gasly. He's outperformed his teammate, outperformed the car. And those off results where he's done extremely well. And that fourth place was incredible. That is that is one of the drives of the season for me. It really is. Gasly, we'll just get it out of the way. We're going to give him an 8 out of 10. The same as Charles Leclerc. Those two have both got an 8. They've both impressed me as equally. Those guys... Pretty stellar this year. Still room for improvement. Like I say, Gasly has been behind Hartley a few times and some weekends has been nowhere. Is that down to the car? We're not really too sure. Same with Charles Leclerc. Some weekends that car is, is just not good enough. Like the Williams is every race pretty much. So you can't really judge them. So an 8 out of 10 for Pierre Gasly. Moving on to another new team that we've not discussed yet. And that is Force India. How Esteban Ocon is in 12th and behind his teammate Sergio Perez is a mystery to all of us. One point difference between the two of them. However, Perez got half of his points at one race. Ocon has been the more consistent of the two, scoring more often than his teammate, outperforming his teammate on the majority of occasions. So it's quite strange that he is behind. But that one fluke podium by Perez in Azerbaijan where Ocon did DNF, has really, I want to say hurt Ocon's season, but it hasn't really hurt it. It's just manipulating what's going on on track. The numbers really don't define what is going on within that team. But with only one space for either of those two drivers, Ocon or Perez, at Force India next year, and it, with it looking like it's going to be Perez, Ocon is, is almost being pushed out of F1, despite being a driver I've been really impressed with this year. I'll come out and say it. 7 out of 10 for Ocon. Difficult start to the year. And there's not been one or two races where I've been, yes, Ocon, driver of the day. And usually I do about two or three drivers in a race that I want to give driver of the day to. He's never really been in that category for me personally. So I can't give him an 8 on the heights of Leclerc or Gasly. But I think he's been very impressive in a car. I wouldn't say he's 4th best, 5th best. I think it's more than that 6th, 7th best, uh, fighting with the McLaren, I would say. Ocon, very solid, better than his teammate. We'll move on to 11th, and then we'll talk about Perez, who's in 10th on 30 points. And I think we'll discuss it a bit more. I think we will, because when I can talk about both of them, I think the comparison between them is very, very interesting indeed. P11, we'll quickly talk about. Another new team we've not discussed yet is Renault. Carlos Sainz, his first full season at Renault, is 22 points behind his teammate Nico Hülkenberg. 
Does that tell the full story? Well, I think it does really. There's been a couple of results, Paul Ricard most notably, where Sainz could have had a fourth place, but because the car blew up at the end of the race, because that car wasn't quick enough to keep drivers behind that had contact on the opening lap, it's cost him. His teammate Hulkenberg, the more experienced of the two, arguably the better of the two, has outperformed him. Sainz, though, hasn't been awful, scoring more often than not. A best finish of the season with fifth in Azerbaijan. That's the same as Nika Hulkenberg. His best of the season was a fifth place as well. But Hulkenberg has been much more consistent at around that fifth, sixth, seventh place, being best of the rest of all the drivers, and that's really helped him progress and be higher up in the table. Sainz next year will be moving on to McLaren. Will that affect him in the second end of the season? I'm not too much. I don't think it will too, too much. But will Renault manipulate things in that team a little bit more? Will Sainz slip back into that number two role? I think he will. And maybe we'll see Sainz fall back from Hulkenberg a little bit more come the tail end of the season. But again, not too much to talk about Carlos Sainz. Pretty bang average season. I'd have liked to have seen him closer to Hulkenberg. And I thought he was going to be come the start of the season, but it looks like it's taken him a while to really get used to this car, and in the opening weekends, that was a big issue, but more recently, I think he has outperformed Hulkenberg a couple of times, just on track rather than just points, just the way he was driving, and so it's very, very interesting to see how that team is going to continue the rest of the season, and the story around Renault, with Ricardo going next year, and can they get fourth in the championship? That's the big question for them. I think it's between them and Haas, unless McLaren or someone comes out of nowhere with a huge upgrade and just blitzes everyone come the end. I think it's between Haas and Renault. And I think Renault will just get it. I really do. And Sainz will play a big part in that. But it's been all right this season. Carlos Sainz, we're going to give him... Oh, see, I'm thinking now that I've given Stroll and Sorokin a 6 out of 10. And that's probably... A bit too kind, but back when I was talking about them, it felt right. Science, I'm also going to give a 6 out of 10. I haven't been overly impressed, if I'm being honest. I look at Ocon, I think Ocon has been better than Science, so that's what I'm trying to just compare it to other drivers. Science, room for improvement, I think. But he's almost at a 7, but not quite. Right, moving in to the top 10, Sergio Perez. We mentioned him a second ago. He's level 1 points with Science 1 ahead of Ocon. Now, this man has had a very difficult season, I would say. And the reason I say that is because of that podium, weirdly enough. That one podium is half of his points in Azerbaijan. Picking up podiums is what Perez does randomly. That was his first point of the season. He then went to get a ninth place in Spain. He got a seventh in Austria and a seventh in Germany. But four times in the points this season is not the consistency you'd expect from Sergio Perez. And when Ocon has been in the points more often than not... It's very hard to give Perez a good rating and say he's done well this year. But that fluke podium throws it up in the air a little bit. Perez, yes, in the past, he's been very, very good. And I've said in one of my videos, it might have been Let's Talk F1 last time out, I said he was approaching the end of his career. And a few people didn't quite understand what I meant by that. And I think what I meant is that I think we're past the best of Sergio Perez. Some drivers peak a little bit later on, some peak early. And I... Just personally, this season, he's not been of the, of the talent and the skill we know that Sergio Perez is capable of, which is a real shame for F1. And Perez is definitely a driver I want to see improve in the second half of the season. He's more than capable, but I really want to see if it is just a dodgy sort of early start of the season or if he is losing his talent. That's something I'd love to know what you guys feel about that as well. Right, ninth place. An overachiever, I would say, and that's Fernando Alonso, something that you probably don't associate with Alonso as an overachiever, do you? No, that's a bit of awful sarcasm if I was being totally honest with you. Alonso, for the past three seasons, four seasons, four seasons now at McLaren, has dragged an utterly awful car to some fantastic results. He's done it again this year. Probably not an utterly awful car, I would say, like he's had at the other seasons at McLaren. He's had a fifth place in the opening round at Australia. He's had several eighth places and seventh places. And again, has been in the points more often than not. And actually, looking at his results, if he's not DNF'd, he's been in the points. And in the car, 
again, like I said earlier with Van Dorn, that I would place probably alongside the Force India in terms of pace. That's a very, very good job, isn't it? And the man who's retiring at the end of the year has been impeccable once again. And I pray, I pray to the racing gods that somehow he finds a way of getting a podium come the end of the season. Please let there be a really carnage race Almost like last year at Singapore, where he almost avoided the crash at Turn 1, and that could have been a podium. He'd have been, I think, up into P2 in the second corner, and that car that weekend did have the pace to hold on. So, I'm praying this year he can somehow find a fluke weekend, or McLaren can find a fluke way of getting that car a monstrous upgrade out of nowhere. Who knows, but Fernando, well, I'm going to give him an 8 out of 10. The same as Leclerc, the same as Gasly, because... I think he's been as good as those two. That is definitely a controversial statement, especially putting Gasly with those two. I don't think people will agree with that. But Alonso, again, he has complained sometimes. He, he has been great this year, but he's not the best Alonso. Room for improvement? Again, I, I don't really think there is. So should I vote him higher? I'm just struggling to say he's been better than other drivers. And, and again, that car is very difficult to say, but... I'm probably being a bit harsh there with Alonso, but what's holding me back is I don't want to give him higher than Gasly or Leclerc. 8 out of 10 for Alonso, that's going to cause some debate. Let's move on then to P8, and another overachiever, I would say, and it's a different sort of style to Alonso overachiever, Kevin Magnussen. And in the case of Magnussen, I, I say overachiever because I compare his performances this season to last season. And last season, being honest... I think he was my lowest rated driver. I was appalled at his behaviour last season, but somehow he's turned it completely around. And someone who I thought didn't really deserve another chance has definitely shown that he did deserve another chance and there is pace in there and there is talent. Magnussen has completely changed my opinion on him. There has been some incidents, which I know I drone on about them all the time, Azerbaijan and Spain, where he did do some stupid, stupid moves in practice sessions that could have, well, really hampered some drivers' careers and caused some serious injuries in practice sessions. But apart from that, he has been very good this year. No denying that. Best of the rest on multiple occasions, would have been fourth in that first race of the season if his car hadn't broke down, which would have been incredible. But then getting a fifth, bouncing back straight away in Bahrain, a sixth in Spain, a sixth in France, fifth in Austria. Very, very impressive results for Kevin Magnussen. Again, has been one of the better performers this year. I'm going to give him a seven, which I think... People will have a go at again, <laughs> mainly because one, they'll say I'm a Grosjean fanboy, which is fine. People can say that. But I think those incidents that he has had in Spain and in Azerbaijan really stuck with me as stupid, stupid mistakes. And some weekends you look at Azerbaijan, you look at Monaco, Canada, Germany. He wasn't quick enough and he wasn't in the points in a car that was fourth best. Yes, like I said earlier, Grosjean wasn't, but I gave Grosjean a 2 out of 10. So, it is difficult. A 7 out of 10 for Magnussen could very easily be an 8, but he's on the bubble there. Let's move on once more to the best of the rest of all the drivers. 7th place, Nico Hülkenberg. Well done, sir. Well done, sir. I have been very, very impressed with Nico Hülkenberg this year. Many a time, he's been a contender for driver of the day for me in races where he's gone under the radar. You look at the first three races of the season, seventh in Australia, sixth Bahrain, sixth China, then two DNFs, but then we had an eighth, a seventh, a ninth. Great Britain, he got sixth. Germany, a fifth. I mean, this is a car. Yes, I said it's fourth place, but... He's getting in positions that, again, it, he shouldn't really be in. And he's just so good at picking up the pieces where other drivers are falling down. He's been, he's been great. And China, for me, was his best race of the season. And 
for many, I don't think that'll probably stick out. But I remember in that race, while everything else was going on at the front, when the two Red Bulls came in to change tyres, so did Hulkenberg. He did a very similar strategy, but he started way down the order. He fought his way up, then going in, making that gamble onto this different set of tyres. A gamble which for Red Bull, if it didn't work off, no real issue. But for Hulkenberg, that was a real, real risk. He pulled it off. That was a race for me where I thought Hulkenberg is the best of the rest. And Nico Hulkenberg... I don't really want to go over him forever because, for me, has been incredible this season. His best year in Formula 1, I'm going to say. A 9 out of 10 for Nico Hülkenberg. I've been very impressed with him this year. And 52 points is testament to that. It really is. Double his points, add one more, and that's Max Verstappen, which you might think that's a huge gap. But I've been very impressed with Nico Hülkenberg. A great competitor this season. And up against a difficult teammate like Carlos Sainz, Demolished him. Great stuff from Mr. Hulkenberg. Going into this video, I, I will mention, I did write notes next to all the drivers. I didn't do scores because usually I like to think while I'm doing my argument, I can make my mind up. And I didn't think I'd put Hulkenberg a 9 out of 10 when I was doing my notes. But going through them now, comparing it to all the drivers... Yeah, for me, like I say, stellar drives this season has pushed that forward. Anyway, that's enough on Hulkenberg. Let's move in to the top six. Now, sixth place, Max Verstappen. Let's get it out there in the open. He's getting a six out of ten. The reason for this being is that start of the season. And I think that's fair enough. And I think a lot of people will agree with that. And it's something that many people have forgotten about. And those first four races... He couldn't get involved in a weekend without causing a major incident or crashing into someone. And even again in Spain, crash with Lance Stroll. In Monaco, he had that incident where he hit the barrier in, was it practice? The end of practice, couldn't qualify, finished the race ninth in the car. That was the best car that weekend. But then in Canada and since Canada, he's been on a very good run of three podiums, two DNFs and a fourth place, which is his best run of the season. But I can't escape that early part of the season was awful. That win in Austria probably was his best drive of the season. His second place at Paul Ricard was a pretty much a no man's land sort of race. It's very hard to think of great things to say about Verstappen this season because of that early carnage he was causing. And I'd love to see what I'm saying about Max Verstappen come the end of the year and come the end of next year when he's team leader for Red Bull with Ricardo leaving the next season. So that just takes me nicely on to Daniel Ricardo. He's only one place ahead of Max Verstappen and it doesn't seem like that long ago we were talking about him as a championship contender. How far away that seems now, he's almost 100 points behind Lewis Hamilton. That seems crazy. That really does. But in recent races, reliability has really started to hit home for Red Bull. And especially Daniel Ricciardo, who in the last four races has had two DNFs. It's been a very difficult time for the Aussies. He's had difficulties in qualifying, which has hindered him. Difficulties in the race. But early on in the season, he was one of the best. He really was. And those two early wins really did impress a lot of the F1 world. Monaco was something incredible in a car that was breaking down on him, but he kept on going, kept on pushing. And yes, it's hard to overtake in Monaco, especially with these new regulations, but he still pushed that car to the absolute limits to secure that win. That was a real, real stellar drive. One of the best drives of the season. I would put that there. He's got driver of the day for me on multiple occasions. For me, his best race of the season was China. I, I do believe that and that I think it was voted the overtake of the season, was it not? I'm, I'm trying to think. The F1 did an overtake of the season competition. I'm pretty sure that one won. Didn't really pay too much attention to it. Just wanted to see the overtakes. Pretty sure that one won. Was a great move. Danny Rick moving to Renault next year. That will be the big talking point of his season and definitely for the rest of the season no matter how well he does that'll always be bought up so for me it's a shame that it's going to be clouded by that but he has been great this year an 8 out of 10 for Daniel Ricciardo 
I'm starting to, I might go back over some of the drivers and, and re-review them because a lot are getting eight and some I think are better than others. Nah, we'll stick with it. We'll, we'll stick with it. We haven't got long left. But Ricardo has outperformed Verstappen this year despite the points gap only being 13 points. It seems a lot bigger, especially with Verstappen's carnage early on. But Ricardo has bared the brunt of some poor, poor reliability. Verstappen, not so much. So Ricardo, 8 out of 10, a pretty solid job. A shame that he's going to Renault in the sense that it's going to cloud the rest of his time at Red Bull. And just adding on to that as well, it'll be interesting to see how Red Bull react to that move. Will Ricardo now become a number two? Unfortunately, I think he might. Anyway, top four, Valtteri Bottas. I have been very, very kind to Bottas this year, and that's going to continue. I think he has been, oh, probably the best driver of the season so far. I really do. He's been so unlucky. The most unluckiest man. One mistake I think he has made this year. One true, true mistake. And that was in Australia in qualifying. Hungry. I always will put that onto a racing incident. Both of those incidents, I think, are a racing incident. I don't think you can say that's Bottas' fault, definitely. But... Bahrain, he could have had the chance to win. Didn't quite make the lunge. Probably because he just wanted to get that points, that solid result. China, Mercedes screwed him over with this strategy. The second race in a row, he could have gone on to win. Azerbaijan, he was leading. A tiny bit of debris with, I think, about three laps to go. Blew up his tyre out of the race. You can see it on screen there. And that picture before with him crying, sat. On the other side of the barrier, that says it all for me. That is the picture of the season for Bottas. But anyway, they were three in a row. He could have won Spain. A P2 wasn't quite on the level of Hamilton. The same with Monaco. Again, that Mercedes wasn't quite great. Canada, again, a difficult weekend. But he managed to get a P2. Paul Ricard, another one where he was up there with Lewis Hamilton all weekend in qualifying, taken out on the first lap. Great Britain, he was leading come the final stages of the race. Mercedes again didn't get the tyre strategy right, dropped right down to P4. Germany, team orders, didn't let him win, ended P2. And Hungary, a nothing race for Mercedes, despite Hamilton going on to win. But a very difficult race for that team. But let's just go back to that picture that one there, man, that is real, really paints the picture of Bottas's season. And I'm sure many of you will think giving him a 9 out of 10 is, is far too kind considering the gap between him and Hamilton. But I think he stepped up a gear this year. I think this is his best year in F1. And like I say, he's been so, so unlucky with Ferraris taking him out and being in the wrong place at the wrong time. He really has. And... Yes, I think it's probably a little bit kind to give him a 9. And to put him up there with Hulkenberg as my two top drivers. No, I, I think he has. I, I'm not going to take it back. I thought about it there, but I, I can't. He's really been that good for me this year and has been so, so unlucky. And even to just be 50 points off Vettel with all his bad luck. Austria, I didn't even mention Austria, where he got pole position, was in second place fighting with Hamilton until his car broke down. I mean, all the time this year, this guy's had the worst luck. And when Hamilton broke down, it just so happened to be the race, so did he. I mean, it's been killer. And like I say, to be the distance between him and Vettel, I hope he has a great second half of the season. I hope Hamilton and Vettel get the luck he did so he can get in this title fight. I think he deserves to be there. We're just going to have to wait and see. We really are. Moving into third then, and the first of the Ferrari cars that we've spoken about, <laughs> is Kimi Raikkonen. Again, under the radars, had a really good year. Podium seems to be every single race. If he isn't DNFing, he's on the podium. He's on a streak now of five podiums in a row. This guy, since France, has got a podium every single time. France, Austria, Great Britain, Germany, and Hungary. Next time out in Belgium... He's the king of Spa. Will we see them him again on the podium? I reckon we will. This man seems to be hitting some tremendous form at the time he needs it. He really does. A season best of P2 in Azerbaijan and in Austria. We want to see him win. We really do. I think most fans would love to see Raikkonen win. And I think 
rumours of this two-year deal being signed are everywhere. But I think it will be a, will become a reality if he can get a win. And that's all we're waiting for as Raikkonen has been the perfect rear gunner to Sebastian Vettel. Has never this season really looked like he could get a win. If I'm being honest, I can't think of a time where he was hounding someone down but couldn't quite get the win. That, that's not really been the Raikkonen style of late of the past couple of seasons. But I think he might do it. I think there'll be one race some point this season he'll finally get that win. And it wouldn't surprise me if it was at Spa next time out. It really wouldn't. But Raikkonen's been great this year. Again, hasn't been that killer, killer instinct Raikkonen. So I'm only going to give him a 7 out of 10. But his current form is better than that. So it'll be really interesting to see how he ends off the season. And finally, we move on to the final two. Hamilton and Vettel, the fight for five. The story that was in the, all the headlines at the beginning of the season has come true. That is the real storyline for this season. Which one out of the two will be getting five world championships first? Hamilton or Vettel? And at the halfway point of the season... I'm going to say Hamilton. I think he's had some really difficult times with reliability. Something that we haven't really said of Mercedes before. And when I say reliability, he had the one DNF. But that car, when it's not working, it's not working. Canada, Monaco, Hungary, it's not been there. But he's been able to find another gear. That hammer time somehow works. He somehow manages to do it. And a couple of races ago when he was behind Sebastian Vettel. I'm speaking about Hamilton and Vettel at the same time here. I'm sure you're aware of that. <laughs> but when he was behind him, I thought, oh, this is Vettel's year. But somehow that Hamilton magic always finds a way. And I think again this year it will do. And I think it will be Hamilton who gets five. Talking about Vettel for a moment. Oh, actually, I just want to mention again with Hamilton. A really difficult start to the year. Didn't get his first win until Azerbaijan, the first time he'd ever been on the podium at that circuit, was very, very lucky. And I will admit there has been times this year where he has been very, very lucky. But again, sometimes that little bit of Hamilton magic has been in the air. And Germany was a perfect example of that. And how Vettel once again this year is throwing it away. It's getting annoying now. Sometimes, like in China, it's not been his fault. Verstappen in that particular race came along and smashed him out, arguably. Other times, it has been his fault. Most notably, France, a race where he could have been at least on the podium, ended up hitting Bottas straight away in the first corner, compromised his own race, had to fight his way back through the field. Germany was the big one. He was going to take a beautiful amount of points lead over Lewis Hamilton. Instead, near the end of the race, bottled it while leading at his home Grand Prix. Hamilton went on to win that one. Hamilton consequently took the lead of the championship and hasn't looked back since. Hamilton getting the win in the next race has now the most wins of any driver. Vettel's got the second most. But... Hamilton for me, he goes into the summer break with momentum. I think he'll continue that momentum. That is the real storyline for this season. And I'll round up this mid-season review by giving those two a score out of 10. Hamilton, I'm going to give an 8 out of 10. Vettel, I'm going to give a 7 out of 10. Both of them, as always, pretty much on their A game. Vettel, though, for me, it's those little incidents here and there that have really cost him. And... Even I will mention it, the, the move in Hungary. Again, I think it's a racing incident. But leave the space. When you're fighting for a world championship, why does, why did he feel the need to shut the door? You know, if he was fighting a bit further down the points or was in a more comfortable position, then maybe. But I think that's why at the time I was so angered by that because he's in a world championship fight. Don't throw it away is what I was thinking. So... That's going to be the storyline for the rest of the season. And I really didn't think my mid-season review would take this long. But my top drivers, for me personally, have been Nico Hülkenberg, Valtteri Bottas, Gasly Leclerc. And I gave it to someone, Kevin Magnussen, I believe it was, and, and Fernando Alonso. They were the top drivers for me so far this season. The worst drivers so far 
Roman Grosjean, Stoffel van Dorn and Marcus Ericsson was that was the general consensus. Teams wise, I wasn't really going to go through the big team that's impressed. I think we can all agree this year is Haas. The jump they have made has been incredible and the, and the worst team is, is definitely Williams. I was going to do a little preview for the Belgian Grand Prix, but I'll save that for Friday's video. We usually on a Friday, the weekend of a race, we do a preview. I know a lot of you are new here. We do the Grand Prix preview, so I'll save that for then. But now, I'd like to go through a few announcements I have for the future of the channel, the future of this show, and a few little things I think you are going to enjoy. So let's jump into that then right now. So if you've made it this far, I just want to firstly say thank you. Thank you for listening to me for almost an hour now. But I've got some really exciting things I want to share with you guys. And the first being I'm bringing back a series I used to do, but I'm putting it into Let's Talk F1. The series is the weekly mailbox. Some of the OG fans and you guys out there, the OG subscribers, will know about the weekly mailbox. Pretty much. You know what it is really. It's a weekly Q&A. And what I'm going to do is each week take out a couple of questions and answer them on this show. Do my own little segment. Some weeks we don't have the F2 report. We don't really have a lot of F1 news. And so I thought it'd be perfect to bring back the Weekly Mailbox, a series I used to love doing. That's going to start next week on Let's Talk F1. So if you've got any questions for me, anything about Formula 1 whatsoever, anything at all, whack them in the comments below and I will answer them or choose a couple of them and answer them next time out on Let's Talk F1. I'm also bringing back another series due to popular demand. I used to do videos that were documentary style videos. They were a lot of fun to make. Took a long time, but I really enjoyed making them and you guys seemed to love them at the time. I decided to stop doing them mainly because I wanted to just play around with the channel, see what I like doing, see what you guys like to watch and listen to. That is obviously something you guys want to see. It's something I want to make. Perfect combo. Let's start that up again. I can't promise when the next one will be up, but I can tell you it's focused around Charles Leclerc and Ferrari. Look out for that one in the next couple of days. And the final announcement, the big announcement. Tomorrow evening, 8 o'clock, I will be on the F1 Word Weekly Debate. For a whole hour, hour and a half, we're going to be discussing Formula One. I'm going to be joining him, John T, and a few others, I believe, if everything goes to plan. I'm really looking forward to it. It's a big, big step for this channel. Being a fan of Sean myself, this is incredible. An incredible opportunity for myself, and I'd love it for you guys to come over and join in the debate as well. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm part of the stream team now, which is amazing to say and it's something when I started this channel I never expected so I just wanted to say thank you to you guys for making that possible and at the same time thank you because we've hit 2,500 subscribers in the past couple of days which I didn't have a chance to say in the Gasly video but I just wanted to say a little thank you now it's amazing what's happening on this channel because all I do is just talk about F1 with you guys and discuss F1 so a big big thank you to you guys if you are enjoying the video if you got this far in the video you're an absolute star if you wouldn't mind subscribing if you enjoy the content that would be fantastic but as always guys thank you for watching like subscribe and I'll see you in the next one